so to lead this session, let me uh, invite to the stage uh, from Amani, uh, our in-house expert on Sukuk, uh, working out of our Kuala Lumpur office, Mr. Baiza Bain, who can introduce the panelists from there. Uh, Baiza? Thank you very much, Mike. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, it's always a pleasure to address uh, such a forum. Um, today, we're quite lucky because we have a panel of a very distinguished uh, gentleman with uh, very vast experience in capital markets. May I invite uh, all the speakers to uh, come on stage? Okay, if we can do the um, introductions first. Um, from um, the left, uh, we have Mr. Imran Lam, who is the Associate Director of Islamic Capital Markets, all the way from uh, National Bank of Australia. So Imran spent hours on the plane trying to get here to share his experience. So, uh, you know, he, he, he would have a very good story to share with us. Um, next to him is uh, Mr. Muhammad Virani, who is uh, the Head of Market Engineering for Islamic Products, Society General uh, from Dubai. And then we have uh, Mr. Riyad Sa'an, who is the Vice President of uh, Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank, Treasury and Investment Department from Abu Dhabi. I think basically, um, before I get to ask, it, to ask my panelists uh, some questions, uh, just um, a point of introduction with regards to Sukuk. Um, Sukuk is currently the buzzword as far as uh, the Islamic market is concerned. You know, wherever I want to go, everybody wants to ask about Sukuk. Why is this a buzzword? Um, effectively, it's become one of the largest uh, part of uh, the Islamic capital market. Um, last year, um, the previous high uh, of, uh, as far as global Sukuk issuance, was uh, about 44 billion in 2007. But last year. Um, the total global issuances uh, breached 110 billion US dollars. So it's effectively uh, making it the major part of uh, the Islamic capital market. This year, we have not reached the end of the year. It's already at 117 billion. So it's predicted uh, by the end of uh, this year, it probably be a breach uh, somewhere around about 130 billion US dollars. Um, we've seen very interesting issuances uh, this year. We've seen Turkey, for example, um, double B rated. Effectively, you know, in, in investment speak, double B rating is non-investment grade. Uh, they issued a 1.5 billion paper to the market. Um, it was oversubscribed at 7.5 billion. And Turkey, for a double B rating, paid about 2.8%. It's amazing. Uh, you wouldn't even think that that was possible. You've got other issuances uh, that created new records. Qatar, for example, um, issued a, a five-year and ten-year paper, 2% flat for the five-year tranche, 4% for the ten-year tranche. It's amazing and was oversubscribed by many, many, many times. So it's really exciting times. Uh, so I think now um, we can move on to um, asking the panelists uh, to share the, a little bit of their experience. I think if I may start with Imran, um, because Australia is actually a new market in Suku, uh, so he might share points that are quite useful to um, Oman as well, because uh, there's uh, a lot of buzz with, in Oman with regards to the Suku, with the signing of the MOU uh, for the first uh, Suku issue, inshallah, in Oman. Um, as far as uh, Imran, can you share with us? Um, the receptiveness. I, I know uh, National Australia Bank is currently working on uh, our school program um, in a country where you know Muslims are not the majority. What kind of uh, reception um, did you experience, uh, first and foremost, with the regulators, and secondly, with uh, the potential uh, investors in Australia? Yeah. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, Dr. Dawood and Amani and this, this uh, amazing uh, conference and and uh, in this beautiful city. Um, just before I start, we're, we're, we're just working on the uh, our, our Sukuk capability uh, at the moment. And, um, and I just want to reiterate a, a few points that Mark Darris said um, uh, in, in the last session. And just to give you a bit of context around Australia, 
uh, and, and, and us tapping in or, or tapping into this, this new industry. Now, Australia is a, is a AAA rated country and on top of that, we have states within Australia that are also AAA rated. So you have New South Wales, AAA rated, Victoria, uh, Western Australia, ACT, all AAA rated um, states. The other states are AA rated uh, uh, entities. So it's, it's quite rare in this time that you have a sovereign which has a very high rating. On top of that, you have the four main banks, which, are, uh, which is National Australia Bank, that's the most important, um, and the three other ones which aren't, aren't too important, but they're all, the four main ones are all AA rated banks, so very strong balance sheets, very safe uh, kind of banks. And Australia is, you know, a, a financial services hub that is a sophisticated um, kind of, has a, a sophisticated financial services sector, highly regulated at the doorstep of Asia. So what that means is that because it's highly regulated, it's fantastic in the global financial crisis because we didn't have any issue, we didn't have any problem, we didn't have any, everything kind of kept on going. But it's not so hard, it's a little bit difficult when you try to create new uh, products such as Sukuk bonds, new capabilities. They need a lot of time to get their heads around it. Um, our bank is, is a very conservative bank, so I had to, uh, just to book Sukuk bonds on balance sheet, I had to do like 10 um, different risk processes uh, and, and to get their he heads around it. Um, and, 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 and that's why I think for Oman, if Australians who are non-Muslim have no understanding about Islam and come out, قال أخ شبعان في ليلة بارحة الوجه النظر الأسترال عن إسلام والسنين سلبية وأحتجنا أن نغير أفكارهم من الوجه النظر الإيجابية ليس فقط عن تمويل إسلامي بل إن عن إسلام والمسلمين كذلك بعضهم يظنون أن تمويل إسلامي ما هو إلا تمويل إرهابي whereas you know they had that this kind of misconception about Islam so in Oman, you don't have that, uh, that issue. So I'm 100% certain that if we can convince non-Muslims th about the benefits of the Islamic finance industry, I'm 100% certain in Oman, Islamic finance would be success as long as the value proposition is very clear and the pricing is, is, is competitive. Thank you. Thank you, Imran, for that very inspiring uh, answer. Um, okay, let's move on. I think... Uh, the two panelists uh, to the right of Imran is a very prominent gentleman in the GCC capital markets. Let's uh, maybe ask them a question about that. Um, maybe I can start with uh, Mohammed Virani. Um, in the wake of uh, the European debt crisis, effectively you've seen um, issuers fleeing from uh, issuing bonds in Europe even GCC uh, issuers, uh, which has uh, strong M MPN programs in Europe, have actually gone back to try to issue in GCC. How do you see GCC benefiting from the Eurozone crisis? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, alaykum, everyone. Uh, I just want to echo first what Imran said, that uh, I think Amani is doing a great job in both developed and new Islamic markets in uh, bringing and promoting uh, Islamic finance, um, and I think we should commend Amani for that. Um, in terms of your question, with regards to the European sovereign debt crisis, yes, you know, we know that there's uncertainty in Europe, um, even in the US with the elections coming up, you know, you know, we don't know what's happening, the markets are reacting to this, and the GCC have benefited uh, from this. Um, there's two ways it's benefiting. One is from the issuance side and one is from the, from the actual investor side. On the investor side, what you see is typically Sukuk were uh, being subscribed around the 30% mark for Sukuk issuances from the GCC. Recently though, we've seen an increase in that up to around 50%. What's the reason for this? Um, there's various factors. The first one is people are looking for investment grade debt which uh, away from the classic markets of uh, Western Europe and, and the US. Um, the second thing is that Sukuk generally has become very familiar with investors in Europe. So um, you see asset managers in Europe 
have had the education about Sukuk, are very aware of it, and hence um, they're quite comfortable in, in subscribing to Sukuk. So you see, one, a good credit um, in the GCC. Secondly, uh, familiarization with the product. Um, and thirdly, uh, and potentially most importantly, is the pricing. From a pricing perspective, um, GCC credit over the past um, two or three years has been attractive. It has, however, uh, tightened quite a lot. The cost of insuring uh, Dubai debt, for example, has tightened by around 200 basis points over the past, let's say, six to eight months, as we say. So um, even then, you see um, attractiveness uh, compared to Europe. Remember, even though the European market and the sovereign market is suffering a lot right now, um, the market has realized that effectively they're long a put option, which means that they've realized that there's always a policy stopgap that the central bank policymakers are, are playing. So from a credit perspective, they are still comfortable with European credit. However, the European credit is not reflecting the sense in terms of pricing the same way as you see in the GCC, where it's still pricing at a premium. This, the last point I want to mention is um, the fact that Sukuk versus uh, conventional debt out of the GCC. So in terms of the general Islamicization of um, the GCC banking market, um, the first thing is there has been a massive increase in Islamicization because of the universality of the Sukuk instrument. Both conventional and in Islamic investors can invest in a, in a sukuk. So this is one thing. This has led to, on the issuance side, more and more corporates increasing their issuance in sukuk format. Mm. In terms of pricing then, how has this been reflected? If in, in the past, let's say about two years ago, or when GE, for example, issued their sukuk, they had to issue at a premium to their conventional bond so that they attract investors. Now the pricing has inverted in terms of the ratio between um, sukuk debt to conventional debt. So you have a sukuk which prices tighter for the same credit for the same tenor as a conventional issuer. So it is not, it's not only the European you know, sovereign debt crisis which is causing uh, an increase in, in issuance and demand for, for sukuk and GCC credit. It's a combination of, uh, of these factors. Thank you, Virani. Um, Riyad, would you like to add anything to that? Well, uh, thank you. Um, it's very, I mean, hard to add to what the guys have mentioned. Uh, maybe a couple of points. In terms of the growth level that the GCC is undergoing, uh, we've just learned about the IMF upgrading the outlook for the GCC and the uh, growth from, I think, 3 to 4% to around 6, 6.5%. So with the need as well of project financing and the lack sometimes of tapping the bond, sorry, the um, loan market into, through syndications and stuff. Now, the, uh, those projects and those activities have to be financed in a way, and the capital market has always been one of the um, uh, resources that, you know, can help. And now we can see, for example, uh, many, many, you know, we learned probably about in email and in, 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 uh, UAE and so many others that they can finance their projects long term through, you know, a portion of loan and another portion of, of bond or sukuk. Then the variety of options given to local uh, companies and uh, institutions to um, raise money uh, through, uh, plus the familiarity of the sukuk as an instrument, have driven the local uh, sukuk market, or the GC sukuk market, uh, up, up the sky. Okay. And we can see there's always shortage in terms of supply. Mm. I, I think recently read something called uh, the, the gap between the supply and demand is like what we are offering is nearly less than half of what the demand for sukuk is. The demands are roughly around $300 billion, and the, the supply is less than half of this. And there's potential as well by 17 to be around 900 billion. So imagine the potential of a Sukuk uh, market in the GCC and globally. A GCC has been a like, sweet spot for everybody because the, it was le least affected in the crisis mm -hmm. to begin with. And uh, the quality uh, of the balance sheets for all institutions has been paramount. Interesting. Actually, okay, I think... Um 
to to just add to what the um, the panelists have, have said. I think because you know I come from from Malaysia, so you know we we experience uh, the same thing ourselves in our markets. Uh, we've seen um, a lot of foreign issuers uh, trying to tap the ringgit sukuk market. So effectively, I think. Um, the Sukuk uh, phenomenon is a global phenomenon rather than a, a, a regional phenomenon. So it's good in the GCC, it's good in Malaysia. We have Malaysian companies going to the GCC to tap funds and we have GCC companies coming to Malaysia to tap funds. So um, one other um, aspect that I would like to uh, get the opinion of uh, our panelists would be, um, I'm sure you guys uh, ha have a lot of chat with uh, a lot of investors. Um, in light of the current market condition, um, you know, what would be, as far as uh, structure is concerned, um, the most uh, acceptable as far as uh, most investors are concerned? Imran? Um, I think from, from our perspective, because we're, we're, we're dealing in a jurisdiction that hasn't, it's, you know, it's not like a man we, we, in Australia that, that has, uh, there's, there's been no uh, change to the laws to facilitate Islamic finance, we are primarily driven by tax. So I was having a chat to the, one, of, one of the brothers uh, and, and, you know, complaining about tax, etc. And then he was like, what are you talking about? What's a, the what's a problem? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know the problem here uh, as much as, as we have. But if you think in a, in a plain vanilla sukuk structure, say sukuk al-ijara, where you, uh, you know, sell the assets under SPV, yes. just to give you a sense of the amount of tax that we've got to go through, is from the sale you have capital gains, GST, stamp duty, and then from that issuance you have interest withholding tax, um, and then back on the purchase undertaking you get again uh, capital gains, GST, stamp duty. So you try to take this structure to a conventional bank and, and very conservative bank and say, yeah, let's have a crack at this. This looks really good. And uh, they'll pretty much uh, laugh in your face. So, but, but, but having said that, so I guess in terms of Sukuk structure, we are uh, in, in, in our uh, um, jurisdiction, I guess, we're driven by the local tax laws. Um, uh, but having said that, we have to comply with, with uh, global norms and global standards. So we've actually developed a structure that um, gets around all those tax issues, which has been signed off by uh, uh, some of the, the, the world's top scholars and um, has also passed the, um, uh, uh, the uh, tax opinion by one of the top uh, uh, tax firms in Australia. So it's taken a lot of work and a lot of investment, but I think we're, um, we're, we're, we're pretty much there. Okay. Uh, um, and they say in, in England there's only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Um, <laughs> but it's, the, the point is, as you mentioned, Ron, it should be a, a neutral in terms of uh, Sukuk versus a, a conventional market. So it's... it's um, you know, there may still be tax implications, but, it, uh, you know, there needs to be neutrality in terms of the, the comparison between a Sukuk and a, and a conventional uh, instrument. Now, um, in that respect, you know, this is what one of the challenges that the new, new markets will face uh, in changing their regulations so as to accommodate this. And I know the UK has done this, etc. Just coming back to your question in terms of the structure, the idea for an arranger and an issuer is that ultimately they want to have a successful issuance which means time to issuance should be as optimal as possible okay so there's no point in reinventing the wheel here we've seen two structures which are commonplace in the market and have dominated since the AOFI ruling with respect to Mudara and Musharaka uh, regulations these are being the Ijara structure and the Wakala structure so what happens now is that um, the challenge and the innovation in structure is more to do with, you know, fitting sometimes a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you may not have a classic Ijara situation, but you want to create that Ijara situation so as the investors, credit, Sharia, uh, 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 investment committees are familiar with that structure. You don't want to go to the market with a new structure and everyone has a look at it and everyone questions that structure. So the market has accepted these two structures. The difference in the two structures being mostly that uh, a financial institution would tend to go towards a wakala structure um, and 
uh, uh, let's say, a corporate or a sovereign would tend to go towards the Nijaya structure because of the assets that they hold. Okay. So, you, you know, a bank would hold a portfolio of Islamic assets which would lend itself towards a wakala structure, whereas a corporate may, or, or a sovereign may own some land or real estate, uh, etc., which lends it towards, or itself towards. So it's mostly to do with what assets are available okay. as opposed to, you know, creating any innovation with that respect. Just to mention, uh, and probably Riyadh has more information on this because uh, it's a neighbor bank of theirs in Abu Dhabi. They, they came up with a, with a, with a tier one um, sukuk recently, which is, which is very interesting. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. They, they're probably tapping a small size because it's quite innovative. Um, I'll let him, you know, maybe give us some more insight on it. But from what I've been speaking to asset managers about, they're already quite anxious about whether their committees are going to look at a perpetual security and how they're going to, you know, book this and how they're going to treat this because the first time maybe an Islamic asset manager has ever looked at a sukuk with perpetuity and with, uh, with tier one uh, sort of risk. So I hand it over to, to Ria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, that's clear. I mean, uh, last week I think the road showed the ADIP uh, sukuk, which as it came as a kind of innovative structure in the Sukuk world as a perpetual um, instrument that uh, can be called after six years um, and uh, within that period of time they can not pay basically the uh, profit on the Sukuk mm -hmm. and they have some kind of flexibility but it's been accounted for as a perpetual on the balance sheet which is treated as a preferred share so as equity so that kind of innovation I was going to actually mention uh, the balance between what the institution needs to achieve from raising the capital and from what the market is looking for. Now, ADEP is coming with, with this kind of uh, type of sukuks that cannot, in, in my view, bought by, by financial institutions uh, by far because of the capital, um, regu regulatory capital requirement for the banks because that will, if we buy, let's say, as ADCB, the, the, the sukuk, we'll have to uh, put one to one kind of capital in terms of the balance sheet uh, accounting and regulatory requirements. And this kind of um, sukuk is targeted towards the um, hedge funds, probably asset managers and uh, private net worth and uh, you know, all these private banks and high net worth individuals. So how successful this would be, it will be actually a test for the market. Um, this kind of innovation and, uh, and type of uh, sukuk, even with the uh, character of the sukuk that this adib is showing, the underlying structure is very simple. It's, more, it's a mudaraba. Mm. So it's a very simple um, structure, um, but the, the nature of the, of the sukuk itself is accounted for differently. Um, let's wait and see. It will be a test. And I think, uh, as Mohammed said, it's something that has not been uh, shown before. Before, um, so there is a, a mix, a balance that has to be done between the institution requirement for fund and the the, the market demand uh, and w the clientele of the of the sukuk itself. That's excellent news, actually, because uh, we always uh, welcome innovation uh, in the sukuk uh, market, and um, this uh, has been one of the few in the last few years because the market has stayed constant as Rani has pointed out, to ensure familiarity with uh, investors, investors don't like to um, ha have to assess uh, different instruments all the time because uh, they are quite risk averse. Uh, so it's always easier to sell the same instruments over and over. But um, like I said, we always welcome um, any um, innovativeness in the market because it will just add to the variety of uh, offerings uh, in the market. Let's move on to, I think, uh, the last part of uh, my questions uh, for the panel. Um, we've seen um, Indonesia um, enter the exclusive uh, sovereign school club. We've seen um, Turkey enter um, the same club. Uh, both have, uh, you know, if any, from a commercial standpoint, very suspect uh, ratings. In, but um, the market uh, seems to be very keen to support the entry of uh, lower rated sovereigns. You know, how do you see um, the prospect? I think it goes back to maybe Riyadh's point with regards to the availability of liquidity in the market. There's a vast amount of liquidity and there's not much offerings. Other than that, 
Um, say, Imran, how do you see the, the prospects of uh, Sukuk uh, next year? Because this year has been a bumper year. Last year has been a bumper year. Um, what about next year? Um, you know, I, probably, I think, you guys uh, <laughs> want to answer that, that question. It's not a trick question, <laughs> even, so don't worry. Yeah. Look, I think it will continue to, 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 to go. You had some you know, big issuances uh, uh, this year, you know, early in the year with Plus, and then, um, you know, the, the, the Qatar Sukuk, and you'll, you'll know how oversubscribed that was. But, uh, and, and given how oversubscribed that is, and, and as what uh, Riyad was saying about the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of la lack of uh, issuances in the market. And I, I just want to bring it, if I can, back to Australia again. And I think that um, with Australia, if we can crack Australia as, as an example of a new market where we have highly rated corporates, highly rated um, semi-governments, um, the if we can tap that, that, that could be a source of, of um, really well-rated Sukuk into the market. Um, that's my first point. Um, the, the, actually, just on that point as well, the challenge for us uh, in Australia is that because they're so highly rated, they can get their funding incredibly cheap. So what it's very difficult to bring up a value proposition to the, uh, to the corporates, to the semi-governments, to the governments, um, when the pricing in the, and I've got certain pricings for, for, for certain credits, is, you know, sometimes 50 bips higher than what they can raise. It just doesn't make sense. And it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it makes no sense for the uh, uh, corporates or, or clients to tap into that market. So I think, um, just from from our perspective in Australia, I think that's uh, that's, that's an area of concern. Um, I've forgotten the question, but I'll just carry on. <laughs> it's about the prospects of okay. uh, Sukuk. Um, so I think what uh, Imran was saying is important. It's it's uh, uh, pricing is very important in in new markets, um, as, and as well looking at having. Basically, we have a supply problem, as Riyadh said. Mm -hmm. There's no issue on, on the demand side. There's a lot of liquidity. Everything is oversubscribed three to ten times. But I don't know if that's because investors put big ticket orders in just so that they secure um, you know, some sort of order uh, in, in the book. Um, but ultimately, it's a supply issue. And, and new markets such as, um, such as Imran was mentioning are very key. Now, the, the problem arises where you have conventional issuers coming into the market and they look at the pricing of it. If they have a natural asset, because we're looking at an asset-based instrument here, yeah? if they have a natural asset and you know, they don't mind encumbering that asset, then you know, they don't have an issue in terms of the pricing. They have to come in at the same pricing as, as they would do on, on the conventional side, and I think they would still get demand at that level. If they have an asset which they're going to account for as being a secured issuance, okay, then they have a different curve from a secured perspective to an unsecured perspective. Okay? The, the, the Sukuk market is an asset-based market. Let's, mm -hmm. let's not trick ourselves here. So on an asset-based market, yeah, the, the availability of the investor on the assets is, is limited to zero. Yep. Okay? Now, if you convert that and you say, even, even in, in that case, even though it's an asset-based uh, market, if you have a conventional issuer who has to put, put an asset in there, which then encumbers that asset, even though it's not an asset-backed transaction, then his funding curve will be different compared to without using that asset because he could use that asset elsewhere to get funding. So, you know, it needs to, it needs to look at the market, you know, I think it will go towards more asset-backed transactions. Firstly, because markets don't know how the um, legal and regulatory environment of certain new Sukuk markets will develop, and hence they prefer to have some assets as, um, as security in that market. And secondly, um, because of this funding element and this pricing element, you rather have a tighter pricing if you're gonna be using a Sukuk, uh, an asset within a Sukuk, than, than not. And this is a problem more for conventional issuers entering in the market and helping the supply versus existing Islamic issuers um, who have a natural asset base which they can, they can use.
Uh, I can just like, add a couple of bullet points. Uh, in terms of the um, prospect, um, the, I mean, as long as we have the troubles around the world, in terms of EU, US, Arab Springs, all of these countries are like looking for the funds they are looking for some kind of uh, way to invest. Um, the GCC at the region, which, alhamdulillah, is stable, um, keeps receiving those demand for, for investments and alternative um, investments. Plus, there is one element as well to add, the development of the tech uh, companies and market, the development of the fund and pension market. Uh, the Sukuk market is an integral part of this. Um, you cannot invest, I mean, insurance companies and the companies, I think they can share this with me. They're looking all the, all the time for asset and you know, to invest into long term and to match their uh, balances and, and asset liabilities. Um, plus, you know, don't forget as well, there is now, now uh, more towards Basel three, Basel two accounting. So you need as well to take into account the central bank regulations and the regulatory framework, which, as we said, added now is trying to preempt or pre-accommodate the Basel III requirements, even though it's an unrated issue. So, uh, by the way, on the on the Turkey, Turkey has just been upgraded to investment grade. Okay. So that's a good news for the school holders who bought the Turkey when it was non-investment grade. So as long as all these parameters are in there. Uh, the Sukuk market will prosper, and the GCC, I think, is the uh, hopefully you know the right ground for for the uh, Sukuk uh, issuers. And plus, as well, adding to this, the uh, yield differential, uh, the Sukuk ta yield tightened this year around 1.20 basis point. So 1.20 versus the conventional, uh, I mean, or even 1% versus conventional issuance, make a big difference on a five-year issuance. So issuers are now tending to more invest into uh, Sukuk and raise capital to this uh, mean rather than going to the um, uh, conventional Convention space. Yeah, and plus tapping a new liquidity pool, as we say in, in, uh, in terms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I open the floor for questions, if there's any? It's, you know, it's not easy that you get uh, a line of uh, experts who will share their experience for free. So I have, I have a lot of actually uh, actions happening now in the Sukuk market, so <laughs> yeah. I, I believe many Please. people have questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, you've discussed the primary, uh, the demand for Sukuk in the primary market. I'm curious about the secondary market and how liquid are the Sukuk uh, when you try to offer them later on. Uh, can you shed some light on that and discuss the spread? the bid ask spread on those. Um, I'm personally not very aware about uh, the liquidity in the secondary market. And a related question is, are ETFs also allowed to invest into Sukuks nowadays if you look at the uh, emerging market ETFs, for example? I mean, uh, quickly, I uh, just mentioned on the liquidity side, secondary, uh, it's now as liquid as the conventional. Uh, given the high demand of Sukuk, it's just like the bid ask spread is around the same, like 50 to 70 base point. Uh, some issuance is fine, like you know the maybe real estate developers issuers. So, you know sometimes you find a big spread there, but in, t in terms of liquidity, it's available uh, and it's as liquid. And um, it's not as it used to be before. They used to say like Sukuk is not uh, as liquid as the conventional. Nowadays, no, it becomes as liquid as uh, the conventional. On the ETF side, to be honest, I'm not too sure because they have nothing uh, on the ETF. Um, I'd have to disagree with you, Riyadh, on the liquidity a little bit. Maybe I'm coming from a different side of the market. Um, the liquidity, yes, definitely it has improved um, dramatically uh, even over the past two or three years. But the problem is of consanguinity, i.e., you know, you have issuers in the same type of market. So, um, there are certain issuances which are which have which are which are liquid, okay? But still, you know, most most bonds still trade five by five, ten by ten. You know, to go and pick up a hundred dollar ticket on Dubai uh, government Sukuk today is close to impossible. You need to work in order for two to three days to be able to raise maybe a hundred dollar ticket on on Dubai Sukuk. Whereas if you go to uh, pick up, um, uh, uh, 
use my, my uh, bank's own home country of France, you know, you can quite easily pick up a hundred dollar ticket on, on, uh, on a French bond, for example. Okay, so it's, it's harder. I think the, the, the most liquid names are, are trading tight and, and, and there's liquidity, but some, um, some issuances, you know, there's little to, to zero liquidity. And you can see this in, in terms of the consanguinity point. You can see this um, if you look at a Sukuk index. So Dow Jones issues Sukuk, uh, they publish a Sukuk index, which basically just is a total return on, on all of the, or on a basket of uh, Sukuk. When the Nakhil issue happened, you can see the impact of the index on one Sukuk was, was huge. There was huge amount of vol on that index as a result of an issuance, uh, a, a problem on one Sukuk. So this shows how thin the market is um, in that respect. Um, so I think there is a much better liquidity now uh, than there was uh, two or three years ago even. But still, this is a key point for arrangers and issuers that they have to, to do. It's, it's still a very much a buy and hold market because of the lack of supply um, uh, dynamics. On the ETF side, uh, I'm not sure exactly what your question was. Are you referring to the fact that can, it, can you have an ETF linked to a Sukuk? No, the, can, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a huge demand for uh, fixed income ETFs nowadays. Yeah. And my question is, are those ETFs, the fixed income ETFs, uh, can they invest in Sukuks? I, I don't see a reason um, why Why they wouldn't be able to invest in Sukuk, but uh, I haven't seen one. Can I answer that? Actually, um, we have not seen an ETF that's uh, investing in Sukuk as yet, but there are around 8 to 10 um, Sukuk funds globally in different regions. Um, And usually for um, retail investors and maybe small institutional investors, they get exposure to the Sukuk through these funds. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, my question is brief on the on the volatility of the Sukuk in the secondary market. The bond price normally goes in very, uh, in the inverted way to the domestic interest. Interest comes down, bond value goes up. Is Sukuk has such a pattern? What is your experience in that? Yeah. Um, the the dynamics uh, are the same. Then one thing, one more. Sorry, another short one. You also mentioned that conventional funds also can, or banks, or institution can buy so so quick. It also happened here uh, for a moment. Then is there any commingling risk or how it is Sharia compliant or any, any more um, the light you can throw on that? The, on the investor side, I mean, either the investor is, um, is cognizant and is, um, is, is uh, he, he cares about whether his fund or his book is compliant or not. In that case, he can't commingle um, a sukuk with, an, with a bond. But if someone is a conventional bond uh, fund manager, then whether he takes on a, a conventional debt or a, or a sukuk, for him, there's, it, as long as the credit risk is equivalent, or at least he measures the credit risk correctly, then there sh- should be no issue in that. Just want to mention something um, so I can plug my bank uh, while I'm here. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Sukuk index, just to, to give you an idea of um, the, uh, the liquidity constraints on the Sukuk. So there are a lot of products in the market on the investor side where you have, you know, because there's two things. One is a completely risk-free scenario, okay? And one is a, you know, let equity type scenario. There's always a space in between these two scenarios where investors want to come in, okay? So let's say you have a, a product which gives you some type of capital protection but gives you some upside related to a certain benchmark index. Let's say it's either Sukuk or it's, uh, or it's uh, Sharia compliant equities or it's uh, Sharia compliant commodities, etc. Now, when we, try and, when we try and create and structure a solution which is linked to such a solution, which is not just a Delta One on the Sukuk market but a more, uh, you know, a different type of risk profile with Sukuk, you can't you are not able to match the same um, properties because the underlying market is not liquid and tradable enough. So what we have tr- done at uh, Society General, and we hope to launch in the fourth quarter, is an index which is a Sukuk replication index. So using other asset classes, such as Sharia-compliant equity, Sharia-compliant um, commodities, the FX market, 
we create an index which gives you the same performance as the Sukuk market, but is also investable and is not as illiquid to be able to go in and out of. So just to uh, you know, complement what you were saying, uh, as well as plug my bank. Thanks. Thank you, Ren. Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, um, Imran, this is a question for, for, for you, actually, and, and, and maybe some of the panelists can take this. Uh, given that the risk-free rate in Australia is, as you, as you have described, is AAA A, and that, that pre presents a challenge to you, um, what are the opportunities of uh, structuring a, an Australian sukuk in Aussie dollars that enables you to get over that hurdle of, of, of dealing with the, the lower risk-free rate? So you have a your domestic market that you could market into, but you also have the the ability to um, to um, uh, to perhaps place that, that bond internationally, uh, and I, I think that could also apply to you know soft gen in terms of the opportunities for European issuers as well. It's uh, a good question. I think um, in terms of the Aussie dollar, uh, the 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 information that we get is that probably that's not the market's probably not ready for an, for an Aussie dollar issuance, given that everything is in US dollars and some. You know, some funds are just mandated in, 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 in US. Um, in terms of distributing in Australia, one, we've got a, quite a small uh, Australian uh, community. Um, and just, if I could just go back to that point on some of the well-rated credits, I'm not saying all of the credits are not, um, uh, are, are priced out of the market. Um, there is a, it depends where you go on the credit curve. Some credits are just complete, it's just way too expensive in the stomach, uh, in the Sukuk market. Um, but some, there is that, com it is price competitive. And when we go to uh, clients, we're not, we're not saying it's cheaper, we're just saying it's competitive with other US markets. And we do have a lot of the corporates, um, a lot of the top uh, uh, corporates in Australia, they raise in, in, in US dollars anyway. So the swap is not so much the issue. It's just that for some credits, um, uh, uh, it, it's just priced a little bit too high. And remember that Australia has a, has a, a really thriving debt capital market um, uh, uh, and, and the pricing is very tight. Part of the reason that is because we have our own, uh, you know, an over trillion dollar um, uh, superannuation um, industry. So um, I think that contributes to some of the tighter pricing that the, the corporates can get. Okay. Okay. Anyway, I think uh, we'll conclude the session uh, at this juncture. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for kindly sharing your experience and insights. Uh, can the audience please give the panelists a hand? Thank you.